feels hard to leave that place of prayer. I just, my heart, there's so much more to pray for and so much more to pray through and what we've already prayed, what we've voiced to God. Let it be said of us that we are always in an attitude of prayer and communication with the Lord. Today we're going to end the service with communion and communion represents that unity, that that oneness with the Father through the person of Jesus Christ and His Spirit alive in us. That, that is to be mirrored in our prayer life. Sweet communion, fellowship with the Lord. I'm just going to have to trust that God has wants me to, to deliver what He stirred in my heart. This, the seeds of, of this sermon really started... Monday morning, and just, Lord, directing some of my thoughts and testing them throughout the week and reading and studying, and they were only reinforced Wednesday night. Dawn's lesson was so close to that very thing that God had laid on my heart, and it was refreshing. I love it when God does that. It centers in on, on something that I need for, for myself and uses multiple conversations, influences to reinforce his spirit's guiding hand. I love how the Lord works in our life. And that's really what we're looking at today. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 4. I don't have it on the screen, so hopefully you have a Bible with you. We're actually going to start the last verse of chapter 3. <clears throat> so 1 John chapter 3, verse 24, and then finishing through chapter, chapter 4. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us. By the Spirit whom he has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He, he who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us. Because he has given us his spirit, of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. 
Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Common, powerful theme all throughout John's writings. The love of God testifying through us that we abide in him and he in us. This is the proof that we know him, that we love God and obey his commandments and love one another as he loves us. There's a lot in these verses that we just read. We live in a world that we can see and touch and taste. We use all of our senses. We can interact with this this world, this world, Life here on earth in a physical way. But that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to all that is to be known and experienced in this life. John here starts off in chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Test the spirits. Paul was very clear, very plain in Ephesians chapter 6. To put our life here in this world into its proper perspective. Verse 12 of chapter 6 in Ephesians, he said, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not all about the physical. In fact, there's a greater world. There's a much greater world all around us, Paul says. And therefore, we need to put on the armor of God because we're going against principalities and powers and rules of darkness of this age. Spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. We are living in a world. Our life is surrounded by spiritual battle, spiritual influences, and we need to have our armor on and beware and be ready. Be ready that when our commander says, go forward or stand, whatever the charge, we're ready at all times to go against any and all foes. Test the spirits. That means, with what we just read there, that means every physical battle has the potential to be a spiritual one. That's important for us to understand. We are created in God's image. Praise his name. Oh, what what a joy to be created in the image of God, to be able to have communion, fellowship with the God of the universe. And he has made us wonderfully, body, soul, mind, and spirit. And each of these aspects represent a portion of who we are. There are individual aspects of our being, and yet they are all joined together in a way that only God can bring together. And we can't separate them. We can try to focus on our physical need, or we can try to focus on our mental strain. We can try to to think about our our spirit, the spirit that we're of, and our emotions, and and try to rein those in, but we can't accurately divide between them. Only the Word of God, only the Spirit of God can go between the thoughts and the intents of heart. He, He can divide all of that because the Spirit of God breathed life into us in the first place, and we need God to sort it all out for us. But what affects us physically? Inescapably has an effect on our mental state, on our emotional state, on our attitude in seeking God. It has a potential effect. 
And we need to be aware of that. Therefore, John says, test the spirits. Just a, just a silly example, just to show how the interconnectedness there. My nose can have a bright red pimple right on the end of it, and it can really hurt. And that pimple would really stand out on my nose because my nose really stands out. But you know, when a pimple is on the nose, that hurts. It hurts to the touch and the, the physical body. All right, we got a battle. But that battle is different from the mental battle that might come. Who is looking at me? What are they seeing? What are they thinking? How do I hide this? And if someone really has a, a low sense of self-esteem, that battle can merge into a spiritual one. What are they thinking of me? Oh, I can't be around these people. They're not, they're not going to want to see me. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. It's a silly example, but we are not fighting flesh and blood. We are fighting spiritual forces. Praise God, we are fighting them with the power of God if we're in Jesus Christ. And we have nothing to fear. Perfect love casts out fear. But we need to be on guard. Again, every physical battle has the potential, the potential to be a spiritual battle. I'm not, I'm not saying we need to look for the devil under every rock or to look for an angel around every corner. It doesn't mean everything. You know, I stub my toe. What's the spiritual significance of this? That's not what I'm saying. But knowing the connectedness and knowing that God, more than anything else, wants our soul. Our soul is the prize. And he's doing everything he can to minister to our souls, calling out to the sinner, ministering to the saints, so that we'd be saved and we'd have that abundant life. It's that spirit that he has placed within us that is the, is the great prize. And the devil knows that too. The devil knows about the significance of our spiritual nature. And that's what he's going to ultimately target any way he can, any way he can find a foothold to get to that, he will. Test the spirits whether they are of God. Scripture says a lot about this, just a few here. First Thessalonians 5, test all things. Hold fast what is good. Test all things. Test the thoughts. Test the ideas that are presented to you from culture. The things you hear from the pulpit. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Proverbs 14, the simple believes every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. We have been given a, an incredible mind, an intelligent mind to, to work with. God has given us as a, as a powerful tool. Use the mind, employ the mind, and guided by the heart with the spirits leading, test the spirits, test all things. There's going to be many pitfalls to avoid in the spiritual world around us. And so we need the Spirit of God to guide us through those pitfalls. Scripture gives us multiple examples of men and women who have been influenced by different spirits. By all manner of different spirits. A spirit that is not from God. A spirit that is not the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of God. There's multiple times we see this. You're aware, you know the sons of thunder, James and John, what mighty men of faith they were. We're reading about their life. Every time we come to scripture, we see the effect that God worked through James and John, pouring out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet, with all their zeal, Jesus had to rebuke them when they wanted to call down fire and to burn up those who were not 
latching on to Jesus' teaching and rejecting him. Let's burn them up. Do you want us to call down fire? And Jesus said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. They had to be shocked into understanding, wait a second, I have not rightly, carefully tested this moment and the thoughts that are bouncing around in my heart. I know what I want. I want to serve the Lord, and there's great zeal, but zeal doesn't make everything right. It must be guided by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth. In the Old Testament, Micaiah is before King Ahab, and Ahab he said, I don't want to hear anything this guy says, but Jehoshaphat says, well, I want to hear from the prophet of the Lord. So he said, okay, bring him. And Micaiah has to speak the truth. And this is what he says. All the other prophets of Ahab are saying, go into battle. God's going to give you victory. God's going to give you victory. This is a word from the Lord. And Micaiah says, therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. And the Lord has declared disaster against you. Now Zedekiah, the son of Chenah, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the Spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. You say you're led by the Spirit of God? And he comes and he strikes the prophet. He says, now which way did the Spirit of God go from me to you? Mocking the messenger of God. But there are all manners of spirits that are trying to influence us. Therefore, in our text, there's three tests that John lays out in chapter 4. And I want to look at them briefly here. Number one, by this you know the Spirit of God. Verse 2, chapter 4. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Okay, the first test. That you would know the Spirit of God. That you would recognize God's Spirit. That you would recognize His purpose, His message. By this you know that you are in fact being led, being moved by the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not is not of God. I spoke about Don's Bible study Wednesday night, and he led us through 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I really enjoyed that. I just want to read two verses from there. Verses 3 and 4. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. How do we know? That we are of a different spirit other than the spirit of God. How do we know that we've latched on to a different gospel altogether? Rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ and its purity. We need to get back to the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. I love that. The purity. There's no confusion with the, the gospel of Jesus, even a child can understand way of salvation, praise his name, that his spirit guides us into all things. But whenever it gets confusing, it's, it's the influence of the enemy trying to distract from the simplicity that is the person of Jesus Christ, the spirit of God. By this you will know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus is coming to the flesh, Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh, is of God. And everyone that doesn't is not of God. So you may say, wait a second. I've had some people come to my door, knock on the door, and tell me all about Jesus Christ coming in the flesh, but they're not preaching what I... It, it, something's different. The, the Mormons say that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. 
Does that mean that they're of the spirit that is of God? JWs will tell you that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And you need to put your faith in him for salvation. What does it mean that this is the test that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh? It means by confessing that Jesus, I believe that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, has come into the flesh. You are saying that the Jesus Christ, as revealed in his holy word, the fact that God manifested in the flesh, born as a man, died as a man, rose victorious over the grave, the Son of Man, fully man, yet fully God. That Jesus, I confess that Jesus Christ and all the character that that represents, all the truth that he is, every spirit that holds to the person of Jesus Christ, that spirit's of God. And anything that deviates from that which is revealed from Scripture about Jesus himself, that spirit is not of God. If it deviates in any way, it is not confessed that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Those cults preach a different Jesus. And the Spirit of God will always be consistent. His leading, His movement will always be consistent with that which is revealed about Jesus Christ. Because in Him we see the Father, we see God Almighty and Jesus Christ. Number two, the second test. By this, verse 6, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That's the second half of the verse. first half says, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. So we need to recognize the Spirit of God. We need to recognize His message. And then we need to recognize, secondly, His voice. He who hears us hears God. John is saying, when he says us, he's speaking about himself, the apostles, the faithful ministers that God had sent out to deliver His message. They spoke consistent consistently with the word that has been revealed. They didn't deviate. They revealed Jesus Christ. Paul said, the only thing I want to make known to you is Jesus Christ. The only thing I want to know when I'm with you is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And John, speaking boldly because of the anointing God had placed upon him, his spirit, if you're not hearing the truth that we're saying, you're not of God. Every spirit that rejects what we are saying is the spirit of error. By this you will know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And that's the thing that really hit me this whole week. There is a spirit of truth and there is a spirit of error. There is a spirit of truth. It's not enough to say, I've got the truth. I've got it. Many people all throughout history have had the truth delivered to them. Many people have poured into it, studying it, dissecting it, writing books about it, preaching lectures and sermons on it. But have they submitted to the spirit of truth? Just to have the truth hit you, it could be like that seed that hits the wayside, the soil that was hard packed and it bounces and it lays on the surface and the birds of the air come and snatch it away because it was not truly received. There is a spirit of truth that draws us into it and reveals the person of Jesus Christ. Likewise, there is a spirit of air. And we need to recognize the difference. The way we do that is to hear what has been delivered to us. To take heed how we hear It's not enough to simply hear the truth. We need to test the source of what we are hearing. Is it, in, in fact, consistent with what the Spirit of God reveals in His Word? If not, I don't want any part of it. Don't even try to, to debate it. Don't stick around with it. That's not of God. That's a spirit of error. 
And Satan's always trying to fish as an angel of light, trying to get us to hold on to something as truth when it's in fact the spirit of error. There is a pattern to the spirit of truth. There is a pattern of sound words, Scripture says. 2 Timothy 1, 13 through 14. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. There's a pattern of sound words. There's a recognition that we must have when we are seeking God's guidance, His Spirit, into all truth. There's a pattern that is always going to be consistent with the pattern of, we see in Scripture. The sheep know their shepherd's voice, Jesus said. They hear the shepherd's voice. They know it. They recognize it. John 10, 3 through 5. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Oh, let that be our desire that we won't even know that, that hiss, that crafty voice that, that is the spirit of air but masks itself as a spirit of truth. You know, both the spirit of air and the spirit of truth will present truth to us. We have to believe that. The spirit of God, he will always deal in truth with us. That, that's a given. Praise his name. He will never lead us astray. But any spirit that is not of God is also going to try to bring us in some way He's going to draw from the truth. If you can see, if you can picture the extreme, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, the spirit of air, truth. He's always going to be trying to take, Satan's always going to be trying to take some of the truth and present it in a way and mask it so that it is in fact truth to us. And we've got to know that the spirit of air likes to major on the minors. What I mean by that is, I'll break it down. Definitions of words. Oh, Satan, we're, we're seeing that in our culture. How many things have been redefined? We know love has been redefined. And if you're speaking about love, this culture wants to say, yes, and this is what love means. And so if we're not on guard to what, that God is love, and we start to embrace a different, slightly different definition, suddenly we're opening ourselves up to a whole world of spiritual heirs. And we need to test the spirit to say, no, that's, that's deviating from the spirit of truth. Definition, Satan loves to redefine words. He, and word choice, not just redefining, but using certain words and focusing on certain words and getting us to, to lose sight of the whole truth. Trying to major on the minor. Planting seeds of doubt. Oh, that first wicked temptation. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did God really say that? You should ask Rachel how, 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 to, how to read that verse. She's, she read a kid's book. To, to, that, to, never mind. Do it. Okay, I won't put you on the on spot, but she has this hiss. Did God really say that? I don't know. She said it in such a way like, wow, that's probably how he did it. Did he really say that? What did he do? He planted a seed of doubt. He major on the minor. Yes, God said that. But just the idea of saying, did he really say that? Just say it again. Did God what, what did God say? Say it again. Did he really say that? Half-truth. Oh, Satan loves to present truth, just enough truth to us to deceive. 
You shall not surely die. Well, that's a truth. That's truth that the serpent hissed. But it's not the whole truth. That's, that's right. We will not die if, in fact, we obey the word of the Lord, if we trust in him. You're not going to die. He takes a sweet, wonderful truth and he twists it. He's saying, it's not your responsibility. God just knows if you eat of this, you can be like him. And all the other lies come circling in. We need to recognize how the truth is attacked. Here's another technique that I have seen, this wicked spirit of error. And that is to attack, to focus on the messenger rather than the message. Someone can be, in fact, delivering the truth of God, but maybe one of their faults stands out, and Satan will say, look, look at that. Look at what he's saying. Look at how he's saying that. And, and to, to pick apart, the message is true, but if he can pick apart the messenger, maybe it'll affect the message, and the message won't be true to that person anymore. All kinds of crafty ways we need to be on guard against. But that's the second test to recognize the spirit of error from the spirit of truth is to hear the word of God number three by this we know it's the third time in this that he says the phrase by this we know the third time he says this is in verse 13 by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit and the whole context of that portion of this chapter is love. If you are in God, then you are in his love, and his love is in you. You can't say, I love God and hate your brother. He who loves has been perfected by God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Love is of God, therefore he who loves has been given his spirit. By this we know that we abide in him, and that he in us, because he has given us this spirit, this spirit of truth. He's given it. It is ours. He does not give his spirit without measure either. Oh, that verse has forever changed my life. The spirit is not given. The spirit is given, excuse me, without measure. We have been given, if in fact we have surrendered to Jesus Christ, we have been given his spirit. We have the anointing. John says, we don't need someone to teach us in order to, to grasp core truth if we're in Christ because we have his spirit ministering to us in our hearts. Praise God, God, he, he, he does give us ministers. He does give us teachers and faithful men and women around us to pour into our lives. In the abundance of counselors, there's much wisdom but we need to receive our truth from the spirit of truth. And we have that anointing if we're in Christ. By this we know that we have that anointing if we love God, if we love one another, if we obey his commandments. That we know we have his spirit. We have the spirit of truth within us. And the spirit of truth will always identify the spirit of error when we trust in him. We have nothing to fear against all these attacks. We need to be on guard. We need to put on the full armor of God, absolutely. But fully clothed in Christ, there is no thing that can penetrate. Whatever makes us more like Jesus, that is of God. Whatever makes us more like Jesus Christ manifested in the flesh. That is of the Spirit of God. Anything that detracts from that, that is not of the Spirit of truth. Let me just finish verses 1 through 6. First John, John 4, 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 
By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of, of God, little children, and have overcome them. Amen. You have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he was in the world. What a, what a powerful text. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Oh, the truth, Jesus said, you'll know it, and the truth will set you free. We are set free by the spirit of truth. It is a, just a willingness and a hunger to know him more, to be guided by him. That will guide us into all truth. The simplicity that is in Christ, keep it simple. Trust that his spirit will guide you and seek him in his word. That pattern of sound words is all right here. It's here. And the spirit of God will breathe life into every word if we let him. That's how we recognize his voice. That's how we receive his guidance and his instruction. That's how we bring glory to his name. We hear our shepherd's voice and we follow. That's the mark of salvation. Not, not just to hear the voice, but to follow. And we will by no means recognize or follow the voice of a stranger. I want us to bask in that freedom in Christ this morning if you are trusting in him you know by scripture about that sweet communion you know by experience what it is to have this, the spirit of the living God in you and we're going to honor him we're going to obey him and his commandment to take communion and to testify of our relationship with him, his body and his blood offered for us. Oh, take heed that you do this in a worthy manner, in a right spirit, with a right spirit in our hearts. That's the warning. But praise God, he's done the work. All, all we need to do is come to him in the spirit of, of brokenness and submission. What a joy to have sweet communion with him. I'm going to go ahead and pray right now, and then as you feel led and you come up, if you're going to take and honor the Lord through communion, you do that. Come to the altar, go back to your seat, and then we're all done here. I'm going to ask Don if you'd wrap the service up, please. Oh, Lord, please let the heart of this sermon excite us that your spirit is always ready and able to guide us into all truth thank you lord for the promise of your spirit oh i pray we have sweet fellowship with your spirit right now holy spirit guide us in this moment lord bring to remembrance your sweet and awesome sacrifice for us and help us to do it in a way that brings glory and honor to you. Thank you that all you require is a simple submission, a broken and contrite heart. What a joy to have communion with you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
great is our enemy, but greater is he who is within us than he who is within the world. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and of God. Do you realize that Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father, that no one knows the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son declares, manifests, reveals the Father to. We know who God is when we see Jesus with a woman caught in adultery. We know who God is, his heart, when we see the leper cry out to him, and I am willing. We see God, when, when, who God is. We have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, who is the express image, the Bible says, of God's person. Anything the devil lies to us about through scripture, through the gospel, through the person of God, through the spirit of God, anything that doesn't line up with Jesus, God who has been manifested in the flesh, who has revealed God, throw it out. It is the hiss of the serpent. It is a lie. It is a different Jesus. It is a different spirit. It is a, diff it is a different gospel. Test every spirit. And know that greater within you is the Spirit of God than the Spirit that's in the world. Oh. We have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. The rupture of our communion has been restored as we as symbolized in communion through the body of Jesus coming in the flesh body and blood of the Lord. The devil wants to take that away, but he's a liar. Greater is he who's within you. Would you stand? Thank you, Father, that we have the light of the knowledge of the glory of who you are in the face of Jesus Christ. Thank you that the very image of the invisible God has been seen, that we understand seeing Jesus, we see you. God, we run to you then. No sin is too great. Nothing is too far out of your power to rescue and redeem. We come to you, your love, your loving kindness, your body and your blood offered to bring the rupture back together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus Christ. And all God's people said.